Thank you. A uh, warm welcome to everybody attending this evening, and also to our viewers watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon, London. Can I just start by going around the table like I did before, for those that are watching on the YouTube so they know who is present. Um, so I will kick off. My name is Councillor Keith Burrows, and I'm Chairman of this Public Safety and Transport Select Committee. To my right. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor Teddy Barnes. I'm the Vice Chair of this committee. Good evening. I'm Richard Lewis. I'm, um, I'm just a member of the committee. Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor John Morgan. I'm a substitute for Councillor Steve Tuckwell. Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor Becky Hagger, and I'm substituting for Colleen Sullivan. Good evening, I'm Steve Clark. I'm the Clark to the Committee and the Democratic Services Officer this evening. You want me to introduce myself? Yes, <coughs> I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm Brian Rennick. I'm the Country Manager of Quello, and I'll be telling you a bit more about myself and the company shortly. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Councillor John Marley. I'm the Cabinet Member for Public Safety and uh, Transport, with uh, particular responsibility for electric vehicle charging, as far as this session is concerned. Good evening, my name is Tony Eggington. I'm substituting for Councillor Kuldip Lakmana. Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor Jan Sweeting, the opposition lead on this committee. Thank you, everybody. And also, we have joining us by link, I believe, from Munich, Dr. Henrik Thiel. So, welcome to you. Um, it's good to see you, and thank you for attending. And as you already know, we do have Brian Renwick here with us as well. So we're going to be in safe hands, I'm sure, as well throughout the evening. Um, yeah, good evening. Thanks for hosting me tonight. And um, I would suggest maybe you can switch on the micro. That makes it easier for, for you to understand me. Or can everybody understand me well? And I can switch off the mute button whenever I, um, I'm not talking. So I don't disturb you with the background noise. Please, if, if you can. Uh, yes, yeah. if you could. Thank you. Um, so we will start the meeting with apologies. Steve, please. Um, we've received apologies from Councillor Tuckwell, Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Lagmana with Councillors Morgan, Councillor Hagar and Councillor Edgington substituting. Thank you. Details of business have been considered today shown on the agenda, uh, copies of which were available in this room um, prior to the meeting. Um, a reminder to anyone speaking today, your voice will only be audible online if your microphone is switched on. Um, that's the way our system is set up, so if you are going to speak and you want people on our YouTube channel to hear you, please ensure your microphone is switched on. We're not expecting a fire drill this evening, so if the fire alarm does go off, please take note from Steve and myself. We do have fire exits behind us here, so they will be our quickest route out. Um, of this building and then we meet up on the forecourt of the Civic Centre. Agenda item two is declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest from any member, pecuniary and non-pecuniary? Councillor Morgan. Thank you very much Mr Chairman. I suppose I should declare that my daughter owns a, an electric vehicle and I'm in the process of buying an electric vehicle. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Um, duly noted. Um, I think we'll have to come and test drive your electric vehicle. Um, OK. So moving on to the agenda, and it's to receive the minutes of our meeting, which was held on the 19th of October. So I will call each page. If there are any amendments, please indicate, and we would note them. So page one. Councillor Edgerton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe the apologies are wrong. That there should be a third apology. Councillor Lakmana wasn't president. She was present. Oh, she's not listed in no. the right. It was Councillor Mathers that substituted. Oh, Councillor Mathers, yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, it was um, Stuart Mathers um, actually substituted. So thank you for that. Um, oh, sorry, I just to clarify, it was, it was Councillor it. Farley. It, wasn't. it was Councillor Farley. Substituted for Councillor yeah, Sweeting, I, I apologise. Yep. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll correct, correct that list. Um, yes, because you've actually got Councillor Farley down as being um, 
President Substitute Member, yeah. Okay, anyone? Okay, so moving on, page two. Um, the, the minutes are accurate, but I was just wondering whether, because there are several issues outstanding relating to our major review, which I hope that the Chairman and Cabinet Member will be able to provide information on, and there are information on page two and page three, so uh, not at this stage, obviously, but maybe we can pick that up when we um, look at our major review, which is agenda item five. Yes, noted. Page three. Page four. Page five, page six, and page seven. So we're all happy with that. Thank you. Okay, all items will be in part one. Um, we've got nothing in part two to be considered in private this evening. And with that said, we move straight on to our agenda item five, which is our um, major review of electric vehicle infrastructure and future policy direction for the borough. We do have witnesses here. Um, I note that we've got Councillor Riley down as speaking as our third witness, and we are going to start with Quelo. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So between Dr. Henrik Teal and um, Brian Renwick, welcome to both of you. Um, it depends who is going to take first batting order, shall we say? It's Brian Renwick has indicated. Can I ask that you do put your microphone on so that anybody listening on YouTube will be able to hear you and it will make it easier for us. Um, and then obviously after you we'll bring in Dr Henrik Teal um, and there may be questions then from the committee to both of you um, based on your presentations. So it's over to you gentlemen. Thank, thank you very much indeed. First of all I apologise for my face. I've not been a fight. It's uh, too long in the tropics for too much sunshine, and they had to burn away some, some nasty bits. So, as I say, I'm Brian Rennick. Um, I am English by birth, but I haven't lived in England for uh, many years. Um, in fact, Henrik and I met in Hong Kong many years ago because we were friends and we did work together, uh, and that's how I happen to be here today. The purpose of this is a very short presentation because we thought it was useful for you to understand a little bit about who we are and how we work, and therefore also, I hope, enlighten the consideration of the committee uh, about the whole point about electric vehicle charging structures. And by the way, I also own an electric vehicle. I have done for a couple of years, so I know, it, I know about it from a consumer point of view as well. And I apologise in advance because the resolution of the screen doesn't quite match the resolution of my presentation. But this is just a very quick snapshot of the picture in Hillingdon today. Some of you probably already know this. They're government figures. It's, it's um, quite um, public, straightforward information. On the left-hand side, you'll see the years and the number of electric vehicles, which are the blue lines, and then the number of charging points that exist today, which is the orange bar. And then I've made some projections for what the take-up of electric vehicles might be in the future, um, and um, an estimate of if your current progress on charging is correct, um, it will be seriously deficient. Now, those projections are just that. Um, I think they're more likely to be underestimated than overestimated, but it just shows you that there's quite a big gap between the number of vehicles and the number of charging points in Hillingdon. Okay. So why doesn't that go forward? Oh, it does go forward, right. Okay, so um, we've set ourselves up, and it's a, a relatively new company. Henrik founded it in 2017. Uh, he did a massive amount of research in Germany about the situation of charging and what people liked about it and what they didn't like about it. And the whole point about Quello is that we've taken that into account in, in our design. And I've used this word in other presentations. We are unique. It, it's an overused word but we are unique. Lots of people have things that we've got. Some of them have many of the things we've got. Nobody's got everything that we've got. And I think it's important to, to realize that when it comes to looking at specifications for electric vehicles in Hillingdon, for electric vehicle charging in Hillingdon, I think it's important to remember that. So we are a one-stop shop, and we've got all the tools available for people. At the core of it all is, is an app. You don't have to use the app if you don't want to. Um, but, but you can, and there are many apps uh, around today for electric vehicles charging. Some of them work well, some of them don't. 
Um, again, our app is rather more advanced than many because, in fact, you can um, book a charging station in advance um, on the app. Uh, you can do that with other providers as well, one or two particularly in London. Um, however, ours is, is voice controlled. So instead of having to thumb away illegally in traffic or something like that, trying to book your charging point and to see where it is, you can actually do it all by your voice. A simple picture. It's, it's something that anybody that uses um, electric vehicles or looks at Google Maps and so on, it's, 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 it's very similar to that. But the point is voice control, absolutely critical. Um, the poll, um, it's a, a very unusual poll. You won't see any other polls uh, like this. Uh, and I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about that. First of all, it's tall. It's 2.3 meters tall. And one of the things that any electric vehicle owner will tell you is it's sometimes incredibly difficult to find a charging spot because it's hidden behind cars because they're low down. Ours is high up. It's got a light at the top, the green bands there on that. Um, will tell you whether the charging station is in use or not. Again, there are one or two other people that do the same thing. Uh, ours does it equally well, but you can see it as opposed to it being buried behind cars and things like that. Coming down the pole, um, the, the sort of the box on the side there in, in, in the middle, uh, that's the touch card, uh, the instruction box, by the way, and the touch card box. Our instructions are not in any particular language. They're all symbol-based. Why? Because we started in Europe. Europe's got lots and lots and lots of different languages. And there are many people in England, for example, whose English is, is not um, necessarily uh, enough for operating machinery like this. So it's all symbol-based. As you come down, and you'll see some more pictures of this um, poll in a moment. It's not particularly high resolution there. But we have two ways of charging. And one is our cable, which is in a drum at the bottom of the pole, and you'll see that in a moment. This will produce uh, an 11 kilowatt charge. And again, I'll come into, and Henry can tell you more about why we've gone for that specification uh, as opposed to another one. If you use your own cable, it will plug in just above the cable that we provide, and that will give you 22 kilowatts of charge. And as I say, as an electric vehicle users, particularly in cities, 11 or 22 is absolutely fine. In fact, it's ideal. On the right-hand side, the bullet points on the right-hand side, it's actually very easy to see the, the whole pole. We also have a little sensor that says when somebody is parked there illegally, not using the pole, so we, you or your enforcement people or we ourselves can monitor whether the right people are using the pole or not. Um, and, of course, it's all contactless payment. Now, in the past, in fact still, many EV charging providers make you have an RFID card or they make you have a PIN or be a membership or something like that. Um, you can, of course, get our app or not, as the case might be, but nothing stops you using the charging point if you have a contactless card. One other very important thing that is not necessarily the function of this committee, but if you look at the white um, circle, the white uh, drum at the top of the pole, um, that is where we are able to fit a 5G aerial. Now, some people may wonder why that's necessary. You, you may do, you may know, but the whole point about this is that as, as 5G rolls out, you will need lots and lots and lots and lots of small aerials dotted around the place. Not just so that people can use their mobile phone, but this whole 5G system will be used for traffic management, city management, and a whole range of things in the future. And therefore, if you've got, because our pole is high enough, and because it can take the aerials, it, it gives you far better coverage for 5G than you would be able to do by other means. Uh, you can see a few poles um, in operation in, in Germany, which is where we started and where we operate the most. I'll talk about that, and Henry can talk about that more in a moment too. But you can see the shape of the pole, it's tall and thin, rather elegant, takes up very little real estate on a pavement, and that's very important when you consider things like wheelchairs and push carts and bravies and things like that. Uh, it, you're not blocking the pavement uh, with our, our pole. It looks elegant, it is elegant, it's, it's, it's absolutely functional. There's the 5G aerial bit. Um, I'm imagining uh, Hillingdon, the little map on the right, um, scattering 5G aerials around Hillingdon, which will be the communications mechanism of the future. And it will be, as I say, a big tool for city management. 
Um, this is really basically the way in which we work, and, and again, Henrik can tell you more about that if you want to ask questions about it. But if you ask, uh, if any city were to ask us to install uh, a thousand plus charging points, for example, we would pay for the total cost of that installation. Um, 300 ch plus charging points, we would pay for a, 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 a substantial amount of it, but not all of it. And then if we have less than that, then we sit down and talk, basically, about how we manage it. But our point is this. We take responsibility for funding it. We take responsibility for installing it, running it, maintaining it, looking after it. You don't have to do anything at all if you don't want to. But that's for a thousand charging points. That's really the end of the presentation. There's a lot more I could say. I don't want to bore you necessarily, and I want to leave plenty of time for questions from me or from Henrik. So um, please, open to you. Thank you, Brian. Um, um, we're Brian saying, we're sorry, saying, if you allow me, I, I would like to, to add a couple of comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, going to bring you in not, in just a second, if that's okay, Dr. Till. Dr. Till. Um, Rich, if we can save questions till we've heard from Dr. Henrik, till, and then we because there may be combined questions for the two or, or individual questions. So, yes, <laughs> sorry, Dr. T, I I just wanted to hold any questions being fired now until you've had a chance to speak as well. So if, if you can come in now and um, just point out the issues you want to raise with us, and then I'll get questions from the committee after that. Thank you. Okay, so um, I um, really don't want to spend too much... Um, um, time on, on any of the technical details, although I'm happy to ask at a later stage if, if you want to. But I would like to make a couple of comments if I try, which is obviously, um, you know, I'm not in that position, so I may be, may be wrong on this, but, uh, you know, we've had, um, um, you know, lots and lots of talks with different municipalities and, and cities and, and um, committees like, like yours. And then, you know, if I try to put myself in your shoes, um, um, I would like to make a couple of comments from what might be important from your point of view. So the, the first one to understand, I think um, uh, Brian very quickly addressed it, but I want to go a little bit more deeper in that, is um, fast charging versus normal charging. And um, it depends very much on the country. And, and I think Britain is not as pronounced as other countries is. But, you know, generally for people that are not that familiar with the industry, and they're very focused on fast charging. And the reason why they do that is because that's the closest to filling up your, your, your combustion engine vehicle at a gas station. So, I mean, we're used to that. And now we want the closest to what we're used to. And now, the problem is in some areas, um, electric vehicles are very, very similar, in fact, almost indistinguishable to um, combustion engine vehicles, but in other areas, they're very, very different. And um, um, very fast charging, hyper fast charging is certainly a very important element um, in a functioning electric vehicle ecosystem um, and it definitely belongs on motorways. So suppose um, you'd go from London to Bath, you definitely don't want to have a three hour coffee break. However, in the city, it is um, overwhelmingly not the first choice. Now, why do I say that? And there's a number of reasons why this is the case. Um, first of all, you know, high power charging, as we call it, with up to 350 kilowatts, is hilariously expensive. Um, the grids um, are simply not made for that. To give you an idea, 350 kilowatts, which is the top notch um, charging at, as we speak, um, is as much energy as a hospital of 300 beds will need. Um, um, so that is a lot of energy, um, obviously, and, and a lot of power. Um, so I'm not saying it's, it's impossible, uh, but you will need to upgrade the grid if you build these kind of e-gas stations, so to speak, um, which is why there may be some use cases, but the use cases in the city are very, very limited. Um, it's different on the motorway where people actually want to avoid the three-hour coffee breaks, but in the city, it's, it's most of the time it's not necessary. Um, the second point um, I would like to point out in, in respect to fast charging is that most EV drivers will, at least in ones, they will want to avoid fast charging 
It's unless they really need it because it deteriorates and damages the battery. If you very fast charge your vehicle all the time, the capacity of the battery, similar to one um, in your mobile phones, by the way, will go down over time. And this effect will be more pronounced the, um, the faster you charge your vehicle. So that means when you need it, you will want to fast charge because of the three-hour coffee break. But under normal circumstances, you will want to avoid this. Um, so that's the second reason why um, high power charging within the city may not be your first choice. The second, the third point is it's not really necessary because if you think about it, in cities, um, people tend to park their vehicles, um, be it in the street, be it at home or, or at work or wherever. Um, but vehicles tend to stand at the place where you last parked it for longer periods of time, maybe it's only an hour or two because you've got a business lunch, or maybe it's the whole night because um, you know, you're at home and you park the vehicle in the street and you allow them to go the next day. So there's ample time of charging your vehicle with a normal fire charging pole. And that is the reason why we believe that fast charging um, is not really needed. I mean, there may be some exceptions. For instance, you could think about some um, e-gas station, to use that terminology again, um, you know, along the, the very beginning of motorways that go up to the north or something like this. But under normal circumstances, you will need very, very little of those. You will need, though, um, a lot of normal charging points. Um, that is, um, from our point of view, we're absolutely convinced of that. And, and it makes a lot of sense. It's grid compatible um, and uh, it is necessary, in particular, on public uh, or on publicly accessible grounds, I should be more precise, for those people um, who do not own you know, um, a, a private house with a garage. I mean, if you've got a nice estate in Surrey, um, then you probably don't depend very much on publicly um, accessible infrastructure um, because you've got your garage and when you buy an electric vehicle, you will buy, put in a wall box there and your problem is solved. You can commute back and forth and, and you know, you will overwhelmingly done. However, if you've got, say, a, a terraced house or, or maybe only a flat, uh, like, for instance, I live, you know, in, in a semi-central area of, of the city of Munich, um, in a flat. Um, I don't have a private garage, and hence I don't. I depend on publicly accessible charging points. And, and to, to that extent, I would argue that from a social point of view, public charging infrastructure is a, a social ML, a, element, is a sort of a necessary element in democratizing electric vehicles. Um, you obviously are familiar with the fact that these days, a large part of electric vehicle owners tend to be more on the affluent part of society. And one of the reasons uh, that this is the case is precisely because there's not enough publicly available charging infrastructure. Um, so th that's another point that needs to be taken into consideration from our point of view. Now, the last point I would like to um, comment on is um, how can you use um, public charging infrastructure in an efficient way. And I understand that, you know, sort of, um, I heard this expression once and I thought it was really um, um, quite, uh, quite uh, well um, explained. Uh, the person in that particular municipality said, Henrik, look, our crown jewels is public space. So we are quite stingy with how we allocate public space to, 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 to a variety of different um, functionalities and, and infrastructure that all compete for the same kind of space. Now, one of the things that we would argue is um, by using the right way of operating the charging infrastructure, you can use them in a more efficient way. Now, <clears throat> one way that Brian mentioned already is we've built in um, parking sensors. And the parking sensors allow in real time to detect if somebody is just false parking. Um, and that's obviously not something that you would want to have. In fact, you would ideally want uh, that people use the charging infrastructure just for the charging session. And then once you're done, um, they, they just drive away. So that means for a given EV population, you will need far less charging infrastructure um, as opposed to a situation where there's a lot of people that just you know, they stick around and then they abuse the charge point as a parking. Um, and that happens a lot. 
Now, the other point, and it's, it's a relatively trivial thing when you think about it, but, you know, there's a lot of operators these days that just don't do that. Um, we have a tariff that is composed not only of an electricity fee, um, but also of, if you want, a parking fee. Now, um, very often in the public, it is this, this um, fee per kilowatt hour is discussed as the fair, quote unquote, um, way of, of, of charging, um, because it's similar to you also pay for, for a liter of gasoline, right? Now, but what we need to take into consideration that the scarce commodity in a city usually is space, and therefore space should have a price. And that's precisely what we have this, this double element tariff, where we also charge per unit of time. We call it an infrastructure user fee because any moment, any minute that somebody's there, he or she, um, uh, you know, blocks that charging point for somebody else, um, and this should have a price. Um, so this is this is what we did. Now, the, the good thing about this, it generates an incentive for the user to finalize or to take the vehicle away upon finishing the charging session. Um, and um, you know we've got some data that I'm happy to talk about this in detail, but I want to, don't want to stress too much of your time. Um, there is a very significant difference in people abusing charge points as parking spaces when they don't have to pay for the space as opposed to people that do. Um, okay, so these are really the, the general comments I, would, uh, I wanted to make because I thought it might be of interest to you. Thank you, Dr. Till. It's very interesting um, information, especially about the, the the dual parking aspect as well, because you're right. Um, those that are having to pay for the space as well as the electric are less likely to abuse that space on charging their car, whereas they don't have to pay for it. They just go off for hours on end and just think, well, I'm getting free parking out of this. Uh, yeah, that's a good element. Um, committee, I know that Councillor Morgan, you indicated. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but um, the, fir the first one I've got is, how does your booking system work and how does it overcome vehicles just turning up and plugging into charge? Right. Now, if I booked up, I expect to be able to get there within 15 minutes, as your website says. Yeah. But I get there, and somebody else has got that got there before me, plugged in and walked off. Yeah. But the answer to that is that it's blocked off. Sorry. The answer to that is that it's blocked off for you because you made the reservation, and therefore nobody else can get at it. So can I follow up? Yeah. yeah. When you mean blocked off, I mean say, okay, yeah, you've got a red light that says, or you've got a light that says it's reserved. Yeah. But. There's nothing to indicate to say, actually, you know, somebody else comes along um, in their own car, in their yeah. own electric car, yeah. and plugs in and ignores that reserve sign. Right. They can't ignore it because the app controls the way in which the, the, um, the point is used. So the app will not allow somebody that wasn't using that particular app with that particular phone to, to, okay. to do it. Thank you. So maybe maybe I, can, I can add a little bit to that. Um, I mean, for people that really want to charge. Um, you know, the moment that you reserve, um, the backend system blocks that particular charge point, and the only one that can unblock it uh, during the, the, the given time is you. But you're right that there may be a possibility that somebody just parks there instead of charging and abuses this park, this charging point altogether. Now, we can't avoid this because obviously we have, don't have a physical means of of, of towing that vehicle away. But what we do notice, though, is um, since we've got these sensors, we can notice in real time if there is somebody standing there. Uh, so suppose uh, we get a signal from that particular reserve charge point that um, after one minute, there's still a car which hasn't authenticated as the original reserver. Then we can deduct that this car obviously will likely block this charge point. Now, what the system then does is it gets back to you automatically um, and it will tell you, look, we're terribly sorry. Um, unfortunately, your original um, charge point has been blocked by um, 
a misuser, or you know, there's there's uh, less nice words for that. Um, and uh, we would propose that instead of going to Miller Street 10, you go to Smith Street 20, which is 100 meters away from your original destination. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sweetin. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. A couple of questions. Um, yes, the charging pole does look extremely elegant, um, but is it vandal proof? I ask this because unfortunately we have instances within our borough that our CCTV cameras are sometimes vandalised. So if they are going to be repaired, and that's part of the contract, how quickly will a repair take place? Because if some charging points are out for whatever reason, um, people are going to be expecting to be able to charge from those points, and then they suddenly discover that all is not well. Mm. So there's the issue of, of vandalism. And I also have a follow-up question about people who do not have a smartphone. There are still people, believe it or not, in Britain that do not have that technology and do not want that technology but perhaps do want to have an electric vehicle. So that's a challenge, and how would you as a company uh, address that challenge? I'll let Henry go on for that. Yeah, so there, there is, you answer or you, you ask a number of interesting questions. So let me start with the first one. The poll is certified for IP10, which is sort of the standard vandalism uh, proof um, level. Um, but, <clears throat> I'm sorry. But that doesn't obviously mean that somebody who spends energy and brings a proper tool cannot damage it. Um, it's not as simple as it may look like. Um, I mean, our or my hands-on test method was simply if somebody who is, has, say, drank a couple of beers too many um, just walks by and slashes a beer bottle on top of the pole, does it still work? And the answer is yes, it does. Um, so in that respect, it's vandalism proof. If somebody comes along with intelligence, uh, willing to spend effort and appropriate tools, obviously he can do, um, you know, he will be successful eventually. Now, one of the things though, that we believe um, we have done differently from most other um, charge point vendors and operators, so to my knowledge at least, is um, we have built the poll in a way that we can exchange it very, very quickly. So um, very often you can see that a charge point is not working um, because the repair team comes onto the site, um, then examines the charge point, comes to the conclusion that there's a particular electronic board that's faulty, say, um, and therefore then they need to order that. Um, and. Um, Unfortunately, the, especially in these times, the electric board is, uh, electronic board is not available for the next four weeks, which basically means it's not working. Now, in our case, what we do is um, we can unmount the pole um, within 20 minutes or so. Um, we usually have repair teams that bring the new poles um, when they go to a faulty station in the first place. And so within half an hour max, they have a new pole up and running. And we do repair then the 40 pole in the depot, and um, then only when it's when it's working again we bring it up. So the downtime really is um, um, reduced very significantly in this way. Now the last question that you ask about the mobile phone, um, you can charge with our um, charge point by simply tapping a credit card into the pole. The, uh, the pole will except all major credit cards. Um, some debit cards, well, most as well, but most credit cards. Um, but if you now say somebody has got an electric vehicle, no um, um, mobile phone and no credit card, then yes, we, are, we shall be defeated. <laughs> just, sorry, just to amplify what uh, Henrik was saying. The point about the phone is to be able to book and to look ahead and see where things are, but you can still use it even if you don't have a phone. Oh, oh. I just have one more um, question about the actual, um, what is the pole made from? Because unfortunately, if it's made from metal, um, 
we have some um, people that like metal and like um, disposing of metal items um, and that would be um, a sort of magnet I think for certain people in our community. Uh, I'd, I'd probably answer that for you. They'd have to have a big lorry to actually take away one of your poles. <laughs> if they managed to, if they managed to dismantle one of your poles, they would have to have a big lorry to put it in. Um, I know they smash them up and they take our covers off our drains sometimes, but our parking machines, yes, they've been vandalised before, but um, very few were ever lifted and taken away. Um, but I'll, le I'll leave it up to you guys to actually answer the question. Well, and since you're not saying anything, I presume you want me to answer, yeah? Um, <laughs> he, he did indicate, actually, I'm he's not very... I'm looking in your direction, I'm not sure whether you can see me or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I must apologise, I, I didn't fully understand the question, so let me um, try to answer what I did understand, and then please... If, if that doesn't answer your question, please please um, add on to that. Um, yes, um, it is made of metal. Um, that is the reason why we have, um, you know, this vandalism proof. Um, actually, the cable drum, um, you know, where, where, where the drum, uh, where the integrated cable is rolled up, um, is is made of um, uh, of um, uh, plastic, um, uh, but it's a very stable plastic. But the pole itself is of metal, and, and the reason for that is precisely what you asked before. It wouldn't be stable enough, um, and the vandalism proof, if it wasn't, it's, it's actually made of, of steel, to be precise. Thank you. I have another one, two, three councillors down at the moment. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, um, I'm interested in, in the... Uh, the electrical consumption that you spoke about. You said that they're uh, yours, yours are mainly 11 kilowatts. 11 and 22. Sorry. Yes, 11 and 22, yes. So that, that's 46 amps at 11 kilowatts. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, presumably you're using three phase to, yes. to power them. Sorry. Right. Yes. And but that, that sounds like a, a tremendous amount of uh, electrical installation that has to be provided uh, to, to power them. It, 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 it is, and it depends entirely upon the city infrastructure. I was talking, to, and I'll let Henrik also uh, add to this as well. It does depend a lot about on the city and the location and the infrastructure. We were talking to um, a very famous um, city in the west of England, um, and they absolutely loved what we did because it looked so elegant, they're a heritage city, etc. But they said, look, we have the most enormous problem because our electricity supply isn't sufficient for what we do today, exactly. let alone what's going to happen. <laughs> 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 um, you can pull it up on the cable, pull it up on the cable perhaps. <laughs> um, so, so, yes. Um, my, my answer to that question is, is it depends an awful lot upon what the regular city supply or borough supply is as to whether it's going to be feasible or not. But uh, Hendrik will have some direct practical experience of this from the installations that, that they've done already. Uh, to be honest, um, I mean, I have never or we have never encountered an, an installation...
I, can I just come back in on that? I, 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 I doubt very much that there is sufficient power generation in the UK to provide for the, the vehicles that you're, we're talking about and the increase in vehicles. That, that's the biggest issue. It's not, not from your side of, of... I'm sure you're willing to put up as many uh, charging points as you can, but we just don't generate enough electricity. I, th I think if I can answer that one quickly, um, I, I read these debates continually about whether there's enough power or, or there isn't enough power. And, and my assessment so far, and it's purely my assessment, it's not based upon anything other than just um, reading the material, is that it does depend what region you're in. Some regions are much, much better served than others. Some regions have moved further ahead than others in terms of developing the power infrastructure. The point you make is still a good one, and I think it's one of the, one of the issues that um, the governments and councils are addressing bit by bit. But it's also down to the supply companies as well, the seven or eight supply companies, and, and they're going to need to do a lot of work. To say that there isn't enough, I'm not sure anybody can say that quite yet. To say that there might not be enough, possibly, but it depends where you are, is my assessment. I don't know whether you... You know, one location or two or three, um, it may not be um, a problem at all. But if you know within a, a given borough, for instance, all of a sudden you start putting up hundreds of charging um, points or charging um, locations, then eventually, you know, there is certainly areas where, say, the transformation, you know, to go to the to the middle tension will need some upgrade in order to serve the city. But, you know, you can even go one step further. I mean, elect electric vehicles <clears throat> are only one element of a transition into a carbon neutral um, economy. Um, we need to electrify virtually all of our devices that are operating uh, with uh, fossil fuels today. And that in turn will require far more efforts than you know, generating only the electricity for electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. Thank you. I've got Councillor Barnes and Councillor Hagger, then Councillor Aikenton. Councillor Barnes. Thank, thank you. Uh, it's been so interesting sitting here listening to you both and all the information you're giving us. Uh, my son bought an electric vehicle just three weeks ago after having a diesel because we had a fuel shortage. Um, and he loves it. And he actually, listening to uh, Dr. Hendrick about uh, the, the not going to a fast charger, he goes to a normal charger, which is actually free uh, to charge his vehicle in a supermarket, which is very local to us. Um, and he leaves it there for three or four hours to work around his timetable in the day. And he actually doesn't want to go to any of the fast chargers because it's exactly what Dr. Hendrick was saying about how it wrecks the battery and all, and all sorts. Um, I'm quite interested, I was going to ask about the repairs, but uh, Councillor Sweeten already asked that. Um, I'm quite interested to know in what sort of problems have you already encountered putting your charging points in Munich? Um, and what's, what, in your experience and your knowledge, do you foresee us getting? I, 
think, again, that's Henrik's to answer because he's got the direct experience and I haven't. So. <laughs> yeah, so um, there is uh, zillions of potential problems that you encounter, and particular the administrative processes. I mean, you know that we Germans are world champions of regulations, um, and I believe that this reputation is very well deserved. Um, so um, you usually have in the cities or in the municipalities, you have... Um, different divisions or different departments you want that have a say in the approval and the built up of the charging infrastructure and they are organized by functions so that means now you have different departments um, that sort of try to optimize the function that they're responsible for and don't get me wrong i'm not blaming them that's just simply the way how the administration at least in germany is set up um, now if you've got somebody who merely looks into, say, whether old and beautiful buildings are preserved, may oppose any uh, charging location which is within a 300 meter range from that particular building that he or she is trying to preserve. Um, you may have other people who are in charge of making sure that uh, your charge point um, where you drill is not potentially damaging um, say a gas pipeline so therefore if you are and then we Germans also tend to be overprotective you need to have at least I don't know uh, two meters the distance of that um, you have other people that look and again it's a legitimate requirement uh, that say but uh, we want to make sure that mothers uh, with kids have enough space on the pace um, on the pavement and then in spite of the fact that our poles require relatively little space they still do require and you can't directly put them on the very edge of the road so that takes away space on the pavement and you know each of those requirements um, is very legitimate and makes sense but the um, the majority of the requirements together sometimes make the process of approval very very cumbersome and time-consuming I think that is the majority of the, the problems that we've encountered. We have rarely encountered, encountered technical problems um, in terms of that it wasn't feasible. Uh, we sometimes had to extend the cable a little bit more than we originally planned to. Um, in terms of construction, construction does not seem to be um, a major problem. What is a problem, again, is the sort of um, administrative process. So for instance, I'll give you one example. In the city of Frankfurt right now, um, we finally got approval to start construction, a, a, what we believe is going to be a large project. Um, now, the grid operator um, now outsources the, uh, the service of connecting our charging station to the grid. And um, he, because of the formal requirements, was not allowed to charge the outsourcing requirements um, prior to us having uh, the final approval of the city. Now, uh, once we got um, uh, uh, the, the approval, we naively thought, okay, now we can go and start constructing. But then, uh, since it's outsourced, it needs to be you know, a public procedure, which takes six weeks. By the time the six weeks are over and they finally have selected their, their, their outsourcing partner, then it's Christmas, and over Christmas there is no construction. Um, and so instead of starting in November, as we could have, or we, we hope we could have, we're probably going to start by the end of January. Um, so these are the kinds of nitty gritty bits that you never really think of uh, when you first start. Um, but in practice, they, they do uh, represent uh, serious problems and delays. Councillor Hager. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm incredibly interesting, actually, in looking at the design for the future as well. And um, I'm just envisioning that wouldn't it be wonderful if we had an electric charger that took the Hillingdon first card and charged our mobile phones up and everything at the same time. But I mean, ideally, that you only want one piece of equipment to do everything. You don't want multiple pieces of equipment across the board, which is what I was listening and taking of what you were saying. And um, what I wanted to know was, uh, what's the percentage take up at the moment of the charges that you have in the public? So are we looking at, you know, you've got say 100 charges and I don't know, 50% of them have been taken up. And um, the other question, if I'm allowed, is just about the 5G. I didn't quite understand that. I'm a bit, a bit 
old fashioned on the 5G. So I didn't actually understand what, um, how that benefited someone uh, and the difference between the 5G on the charging points and the 5G on a mobile phone charging point might sound a bit obvious, but I didn't really quite understand that. So if you could explain that, that would be lovely. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the 5G one, let me just tell you what, you know, it, it is all, all very new. Um, and because I'm, um, I'm, I've been involved with Hong Kong and China for a long time, I keep an eye on what China is doing, and China is doing a lot in 5G domestically. And so you pick up all the good bits and the bad bits from the Chinese press. So the point about 5G is this, yes, it is a communication device like 3G, 4G, and everything else was before. So yes, you can pick up your mobile phone. It will handle more data. It will handle more data faster. Um, you won't get the problem, for example, I was reading about the other day, where in a football stadium, when the match finishes, nobody can actually use their mobile phone because everybody's trying to use it at the same time. And therefore, the system kind of sort of degrades. That, that is much less likely to happen with 5G. But the other point is, and where people are beginning to get really quite enthusiastic about it, it, it hasn't quite come here yet, but you can talk to people who do find it enthusiastic. And that is everything from traffic management, city management, traffic light control, all of these sort of things that enable a city to function smoothly, you can do all that with 5G. Without, I won't say without thinking about it, it's got to be designed and manned, all that kind of stuff. But you can do that with 5G, which you can't do um, by any other normal means. Everything is, is where it's going to be. Now, of course, somebody's going to invent a 6G or a 7G or a 10G sooner or later, but, but the principle is that's where it comes from. So let me ask, uh, Henrik can, can, can answer the, the, the first one, I think. Yeah, um, it depends on obviously how you measure that. Um, we have, we measured over 24 hours a day, and we are roughly in the range right now of 40%. Now, 40% may not sound a lot, but it actually is an awful lot. Um, if, you, if you think about it, it means that on average, um, on uh, 24 hours, we've got um, a usage of more than eight hours per day. Um, which is quite substantial. So that means basically during daytime, um, very often the charger is almost continuously taken. Um, so um, for us, we think of 30% as a threshold of um, where we would actually start to invest in additional charging facilities in order to satisfy the, the demand. Thank you. Councillor Aginton. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it's quite interesting. Um, I see that in Hillingdon there, there are two main issues, as far as I see, with charging points. One is in car parks, where all of the provisions seem to be really low power, three or five kilowatts, which are really unsatisfactory, I guess, for most cars, particularly some of the newer cars which have got um, ranges of up to about 300 miles or so. So to try and, with perhaps 70 or 80 kilowatt um, batteries. So having very low charging really is um, not satisfactory. And the other, but I, and I can understand that your proposals seem to work well within car parks and it looked like in kind of city centres or round cities. But one big problem for a large number of people is that they haven't got any charging facility at their home because they haven't got any off-street parking. And I wonder how realistic the 11 or 22 kilowatt charging would be in those circumstances. I know that neighbouring boroughs such as Harrow seem to have quite a lot of on-street parking facilities, um, or, sorry, on-street uh, charging facilities um, in certain areas. Um, I don't think we do, but I wonder whether your proposal would, be, would link in with that. L let me answer that one first before turning over to Henrik. I, I can give you an answer to that on personal experience. All right. Um, so I, um, I live in Fulham. I, I used to live in the West Country, but I now live in Fulham. Um, Fulham has a, a number of electric vehicle charging points dotted around the place. Um, and because I know where they are, 
Um, I know when I can get there and when I can't, and if I've got a long journey, I go and charge up fully. Uh, just running around the city, I, I, I just I, I don't usually bother. So to answer your question, yes, under what I would call the situation where you don't have the facility to charge at home, and for example, in, in my other house, I used an ordinary three-pin plug to charge, and that was fine. Um, but if you don't have that, then you do need to go to somewhere local in order to charge your car up. From absolutely from personal experience, I do lots of long trips, I do lots of short ones. I probably go to a charging station once a week, something like that. And that's within um, 500 yards, maybe, maybe half a mile um, from, from where I live. So it's actually quite easy. I put, pick the car up, go there, charge it up, and bring it back again. And it's done in, in as Henry was saying, it's, it's done in a shopping trip, it's done in all sorts of ways. So I don't see that as being a problem. You do obviously need to have enough dotted around so that people can, don't have to walk that far to, to get to it. Um, but otherwise, it, it, it works actually very well. It, and you need, as I say, you need a reasonable number, but it doesn't have to be massive. Henrik, I don't know whether you've got something else to add to that. Well, um, um, I didn't know you, that you are that sporty, Brian, um, because you, you walk 500 yards. Um, it's already quite something, in particular, um, you know, in say, the not-so-nice season. So most people tend to have a sort of a natural barrier. They walk two to 300 meters, but anything beyond that um, is a little bit too far. So that's what we ideally would be aiming at, that you never have to walk more than, say, 250 meters in order to find your next charge point. Um, but yes, it is, as Brian says, uh, we'd be happy to provide um, charging infrastructure also in residential areas, precisely of, of the point that you pointed out, sir. Councillor Sweet, and then I've got Councillor Morgan again. These are fantastic questions, Jen. I mean, they are really great questions. Oh, well, it'll go down hills from now <laughs> on. Because because we, have a, we have a good committee, that's why. Um, <laughs> um, the report that we have in front of us um, hasn't suggested that you've been developing your, your product in Britain, but the, the, the point that you made earlier seemed to suggest you had. So I would have found it useful to have had that report from that heritage site in the West Country that you mentioned. Uh, I don't know whether that could be forthcoming and we could have something from sure. that particular city. Um, secondly, I'd like to sort of share with you the problem that we've got in certain parts of the borough, which is there's just not enough space to park cars in local, I won't say estates, but local roads. And there's already, um, you know, a tension between certain um, groups saying, you're parking outside my house and I can't get my car there. If we're also going to be taking up um, space with charging, um, your experience throughout, you know, your, 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 your experience, how has that worked in, in other countries? I, I'll, I'll um, let Hendrik ask them to answer the second one, but the first one for me is, um, it, is relatively straightforward. Um, I have been part of Quero since I think it's May, June, something like that. Um, I have talked to, as I say, 20 or 30 councils like yours and, and or officials or whatever else it may be. We haven't installed any poles at all yet in the UK. So when you talk about development, we're developing the company, we're developing the business, and we haven't done installations yet. So I can't give you any direct personal experience or stuff. When I was talking about the heritage city, I can give you lots and lots and lots of examples of people that have told me things um, which I have, have hoisted in. And so it, it comes from their experience and their knowledge rather than our direct operation, if you see what I mean. So Henry, second point. Yeah, um, when we actually started the company um, a number of years ago, four years ago, um, we heard this argument quite frequently, um, in particular uh, politicians or politician-minded or politic-minded people that saw re-election um, were more concerned about this. Um, and in fact, uh, our experience is that in, in the recent month and, and maybe two years, this has abated. Um, we don't hear this argument anymore, maybe because people tend to understand that EVs are coming and they are here to stay. And then, you know, everybody that thinks, you know, five minutes about EVs also knows that um, charging infrastructure is needed. Um, I'm not saying that everybody will be 
perfectly happy if there's a charging point in front of their house, and particularly if they just decided that they're going to go for another diesel. Um, but um, it does not seem to be that much of an issue anymore as it used to be, at least verbally, um, you know, when we first started off. Just, just to, sorry, I beg your pardon, Chairman. Um, just to, to, to cap to that, one, one also needs to look at what an ideal ratio of charging points to electric cars is, which is one of the, the charts I showed you at the beginning. And at present, at present, the kind of accepted norm is <coughs> excuse me, one charging point for 10 cars. Now, that begs the question as to what size the charging point and how powerful and so on and so forth. But you said one for 10. Um, I think that's likely to reduce as the battery capacity increases, but then you, you say you've got the, the issue of how long it takes to charge. But if one works on a ratio of 1 to 10, there's still, as it were, nine parking spaces available if you just take the crude mass. Um, but it, it, it can be a problem, I think. I've heard about this in the borough where I live. They are very careful about consulting with the local population before they put one in the streets and so on, and they listen to the objections. And You, know, you have to go through these processes. I'm sure you're much more familiar with it than I am. Um, but I think overall, as Henrik says, it is settling down and it is getting more acceptable and more people are actually asking for them because more people are getting electric cars. You know, I, I think it is also a fact that it would have to be the local authority that would have to oversee such issues. Consulting with residential areas is one of the most important factors. In Hillingdon, we're extremely good at consultation especially for our parking management schemes, road safety schemes, etc. Um, so it would be something in partnership with the supplier that would have to be managed very well by the local authority, i.e. if it was Hillingdon, Hillingdon in this case. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, Councillor Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I've um, been looking at charge map and I see we, you've got three streets in total where you've got um, your charge points, uh, one in Hamburg, one in Munich, and one just outside Munich, southeast of Munich. Um, when do you think you'll be getting some in the UK? <laughs> but if you call us tomorrow, we'll do it tomorrow, right? <laughs> um, I mean... Henry will, will tell you, I'll pass it over to him in a moment, he will tell you what the progress has been in, in, in Europe. And, and obviously we are hoping to make a, a progress as much as we can. We're in the hands of authorities like you. Uh, we're in the hands of planning people. All the people we've talked to so far, without any exception whatsoever, have absolutely loved what we do. But there's, there's history, there's consultation, there's planning, there's a whole range of things which Henrik was alluding to earlier on. It's the same in Germany as well. So there is nothing holding us back once you give us the word. I'd put it like that. I thought it's shorter. I'd be very disappointed if we didn't put up the, uh, the first charge points in the first half of 2022. He's putting me on the spot when he says that, you see. <laughs> yeah, no, no pressure, Brian. <laughs> Any other question? No? Um, Councillor Lewis. Yeah, sorry, I, I know it's rather last minute, but I, I, the the problem I have is that the government, the UK government, is saying that by 2030 uh, we will be only able to sell uh, electric vehicles into the country, and by that time I don't think there will be sufficient infrastructure um, to to charge up those cars, and I. Uh, and I think we're seeing it being kicked down the street by politicians uh, who aren't going to be in power in 2030, and this is just greenwashing. I mean, it's not um, the, the, the minimal effects that actually, I'm sorry to say this, but the minimal effect that uh, changing all our cars to electric will have on the environment is, is just, we're just moving the pollution from one area to another area. And with cars, internal combustion engines becoming far more efficient than they have been, they're actually more efficient in power generation than some of the power stations. So uh, we're going to get to the stage where companies like Porsche and um, 
Mazda and Toyota and um, and Subaru are working on synthetic fuels which are carbon neutral if not carbon negative that surely it will help, will help dramatically having electric vehicles in terms of pollution within towns but it just it's not an efficient way of um, of converting uh, of improving the environment and becoming supposedly more environmentally friendly um, I, I'm, I'm led to believe that 15 cargo ships produce more pollution than all the, all the internal, combust all internal combustion engines used in the in the world. So it, I'm probably I'm probably saying this to the wrong people, but I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is just what do you say to the fact that this is just greenwashing and. Um, this is a, a, a lovely question again, and a, and a debate I'd love to engage in because um, uh, I, I agree so much with some of what you say. Um, I don't know how many of you use the app called Windy. Um, Windy is one of these weather forecasting apps which is very, very detailed. And Windy has it's a global pollution scale, so apart from rain and thunder and lightning and snow, you can actually check pollution. The biggest areas of pollution certainly are in cities, but the really big areas are in the English Channel and around the, the, the Straits of Gibraltar, and that's purely because of shipping. So I think you make that point very well. I'm not sure what I would say, and again, I'm not a politician, and I've got no sort of particular political affiliations, um, and I do think these are political issues. You haven't mentioned hydrogen, for example. Um, electricity for vehicles generated by hydrogen does the same thing and people swear that it's much better than uh, lithium batteries and, and so on. And I think that's a debate that's going to continue to rumble around. I, I think you're 100% right in saying, is this the only way of doing things? Um, and, and of course it isn't. Is it going to solve all the problems? No, it isn't. However, we do have a situation where something needs to happen. Uh, um, electric vehicles have been demonstrated time and time and time again to reduce pollution in cities and on roads by more than almost anything else. And so I feel passionately, not just because of credit, not just, not just because I have an electric car, I, I feel passionately that they are the answer. They're not the ultimate answer, they're not going to be the ultimate answer forever, but they are the answer for now, is how I would see it. Henrik, any comments? No, I think you, you answered this question very eloquently. Nothing to add. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just come in on the infrastructure bit. Um, at the moment, we haven't got the infrastructure, but that's what everybody's building towards now. And come 2030, the only thing we're going to see disappear is the sale of petrol and diesel vehicles. But that doesn't mean to say everybody's going to own an electric vehicle and want that infrastructure there and then by 2030. So if we're building the infrastructure going forward now, we should have, okay, we may not have 100% adequate numbers, but we certainly have a lot more than we've got now, and then we just have to build on from that. But I know Councillor Lewis wants to come back in now, so Councillor Lewis. Uh, I, 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 I do think there's a massive issue about power generation I, 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 that everybody's just ignoring. I, and the infrastructure to get that into town centres. But also, I mean, the other major issue is that actually this is almost colonialism in, again in as much as we're, we're attacking countries that have lithium in them. And uh, m the mining of lithium is a particularly revolting and dirty operation. Um, so we're, 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 as I say, greenwashing because we're, we're tidying up our act uh, at the expense of uh, other countries, uh, let least the least economically developed countries that actually need the trade in lithium. I, I'm, I'm honestly, <clears throat> I think as I say, I'd love to sit down and debate because there are a lot of debates here, but I'm not sure that we're, we're in a position to answer that, that point, frankly. <laughs> okay, uh, any other no, and I do, I do apologise for saying, to raising this because it's really nothing to do with the infrastructure. No, no need to apologise at all. From my point of view, no need to apologise at all. I, 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 I think Brian would debate this with you all evening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions to either Brian or Dr. Henrik Teal? No? Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining our committee this evening. 
especially Dr. Till from Munich. Um, I understand you're going into lockdown again shortly, aren't you? In Munich or certainly around there? Yeah, we, we certainly will because uh, numbers are skyrocketing. Um, yeah. So uh, unfortunately, um, we've already gone back to um, home office and I'm afraid more measures will yeah. come as we speak. We'll, we'll certainly keep safe. Um, I'm sure you will. I'm sure thank you've you. been doing that anyway. But thank you, Brian, as well. Um, it has been thank you for your time. extremely interesting listening um, and seeing what you've got within your polls with the 5G. So you haven't only thought about the electric charging point, you've thought about the future of the mobile phone in the same unit, um, which when you look at some of the 5G aerials that companies want to erect, your height of yours is quite favourable. Um, that's all I'm going to say on the subject. Um, but thank you to the pair of you. Um, we've thoroughly enjoyed your presentations and the answers to all our questions, so thank you. Thank you very much indeed for having us. It's Thank been a pleasure. And, and I've enjoyed finding my way to the council room. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much for your time today. And can I just add my thanks Thank you. to you both? Bye then. Bye. 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 You are free to go with, if you wish. I'm free to go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, officer. Not that we're holding you, but you're welcome to stay until the end. Of it. <laughs> Thank you again, Brian. No, not at all. Um, when you speak to Dr. Henrik, can you thank him again? I certainly will. We've got to wait for our um, clerk to come back because we could question you off off record. <laughs> well, yeah, Henrik is in lockdown in Munich. Yeah. Um, Brian could have probably done it actually. Okay, so we now move on to um, our third witness of the evening, Councillor John Riley, Cabinet Member for Public Safety and Transport. Welcome, Councillor Riley, to our committee. Um, we will start really by asking you to just summarise for you, for us, where you think Hillingdon are currently, as far as. EVs are concerned um, and then obviously I'm sure councillors will have questions for you Councillor Sweetin's already nodding and she hasn't even heard you speak yet um, <laughs> so in fact she's got <laughs> almost an A4 piece of paper um, <laughs> so if, if you could Councillor uh, Riley just run through where Hillingdon are at the moment as far as you're concerned as the cabinet member um, I know from Alan Tilley's submission to the committee last time he was telling us about the tender that was out currently uh, at the time then um, so if you could just
brief where we are at the moment, please. Well, if I, if I can Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to uh, come to your committee to deal with this topic, which, as you know, I, I um, uh, took over in uh, February of this year. And this was one of the first big ticket items that um, I was charged with, no pun intended, uh, dealing with. Um, and at the time, I can't say anything other than the... Um, charging electric vehicle charging offer that we had um, uh, uh, was in, in the uh, lower leagues without any question um, but since then uh, we've done a great deal of uh, research and by we I mean myself and uh, officers of course um, into various aspects of this uh, as you heard from our two earlier witnesses who, um, whose company hasn't even started in this country. Um, there are an enormous amount of challenges, and members of this committee have asked the sort of questions that I and the officers have been asking uh, uh, about how we go about this, because there is clearly, uh, looking up and down the country and talking to colleagues from other uh, authorities across the country, um, essentially two um, approaches that have been taken. Uh, one is going off like a rocket and putting in as many uh, charging points in all sorts of places as humanly possible and then sadly coming to the conclusion that was the wrong decision and local authorities spending an awful lot of money uh, on systems that frankly um, weren't going to last uh, to the end of this year let alone uh, uh, 5, 10 and more years and others who have been more cautious and we have certainly fallen into the slightly more cautious brigade because, um, as um, I said to Steve earlier on, but I uh, said to him that he's probably too young to remember, but he um, uh, proved me wrong, we did not want to become Betamax man. In other words, choosing a system that was going to be the wrong one, or at least choosing a system that was going to fall to pieces in five years' time, or not be the right system at all, as Councillor Lewis uh, uh, points out in terms of where we are because one of the important issues is to be able to look forward with some clarity and be certain that we are not spending a lot of residents money on systems that frankly will be obsolete in a short period of time I think in a large way we're not going to do that um, where are we now? Well, I can tell you that, uh, having read your minutes from last time, that um, uh, uh, officers described to you uh, in much more detail where we are now, uh, following on from a number of visits that I made to other authorities to see what they were doing, it seemed to me that the best approach was to um, not do it in-house and not do it ourselves, and to put the both technological risk and the financial risk in the hands of a commercial partner. And that is what most of the authorities that have gone down the sensible route have done, which is to go into partnership with an existing and well-trammeled um, commercial partner who are able to do a lot of different things. And one of the authorities I went to see were uh, Oxford, who are already a, a little bit ahead of us. They've opted for a car park uh, charging regime first because rather like us a lot of their car parks are near residential areas so what they've done is go into partnership with a, a, a very good organisation who, who have already put units in their car parks they look at and it's a very difficult balance to strike even for these very good professionals it's the chicken and egg thing it's the purchase of vehicles set against the installation of charging units and nobody within the industry is quite certain as to which one leads and which one causes the other one to work. There are various uh, uh, divisions of opinion on that which I've been uh, informed about. But to answer your question, um, we have at the moment 12 car parks with charging units in them. Most of them uh, which... Uh, Mr Chairman you'll probably know yourself are um, in terms of the industry quite elderly um, worked some years ago 
uh, probably aren't fit for purpose now, but nevertheless, um, the car park charging model was gone down at that stage. So uh, 12 uh, across various um, geographical locations across the borough. So the, um, and no doubt Alan Tilly would have told you last time that the, um, the design of the tender that's gone out and is yet to finish um, and, and have a uh, partner in place is multifaceted. Um, we have suggested that the starting point should be car parks for various reasons, not, uh, uh, one of which is that many of our car parks are near uh, residential areas, that when you actually look, um, and I would challenge uh, almost any of us as members to know exactly where all the car parks that we have in this borough are, because quite honestly, having been driven around nearly all of them, well, yeah, apart from you, uh, or possibly <laughs> me now, but having been driven around me, uh, nearly all of them, uh, uh, it's astonishing where some of them are, tucked away behind places. And um, uh, uh, the, uh, I've, I've, um, I believe that I've, to a large extent, uh, won the I would like to build on this site fight um, that somebody else is launching um, when we discover these little places, and you know who I mean. Um, but, and, but, no, but seriously, that one of the ideas is to use those small and residentially located car parks as charging parks. Um, and the tender is written in such a way that the uh, end partner will, be, will first of all uh, review and survey all our car parks. They will probably manage to get better uh, usage in terms of numbers of cars per car park. They will already have had, um, hopefully, uh, looking at some of the companies, uh, experience in designing the sort of problems out that were spoken about earlier. In other words, do you charge for parking and for charging, or is it a joint charge? Um, when you have uh, car parks that end their charging at 6 or 6.30 or 7 or whatever it is, can people park for free overnight uh, and charge overnight? Um, do, uh, uh, do we use um, those existing for small car parks as charging parks? Do we look at the very considerable number of garage areas where people cannot park their cars in the garages because the garages were built at a time when the cars were thinner and smaller and maybe convert those into local charging park areas? Um, there's a whole host of things that these companies do when they come in to help the authority deliver, in the first instance, the first wave, as it were. Now, I noticed from your uh, minutes that you had uh, Mr. Heritage, who came to see you previously, and he is, has been a very uh, frequent correspondent with me. Um, and he raises the issue quite rightly, and we'd already thought about this. Um, what do you do, and what are the disparity and equality issues around those with on-site domestic charging capacity, those who might have on-site domestic charging capacity, where does that leave our um, domestic crossover policy in terms of width and length and uh, risk of uh, an initial small car policy turning into one where vehicles overhang the pavement and cause obstructions and that sort of thing? Um, at the moment, a lot of electric vehicles are very small, which is great, but what, do, what happens when they get bigger? And we've reduced our crossover policy to accommodate small cars. These are the sort of things that not everybody considers. Um, and then you've got the issue about how do you run um, on-street parking, uh, sorry, on-street charging. Do you do, as some boroughs have done, have lots of posts? And then you have problems, as I've been alerted to, about people claiming that the one in front of their house is theirs and nobody else should use it, putting their own cones out. And also, I went down to Eastleigh and I, I all I got really was a, was a, a, a sort of um, 
Boxing Night report. I don't mean the day after Christmas, I mean fighting report. Uh, uh, people claiming that the thing outside their house was theirs. And so there's a lot of different considerations. But the way we've chosen to go is with a partner who will be progressive and tell us what we need, when we need it, and that's the better way to deal with things. That's my sort of opening remarks, if you like. Okay, before I bring in Councillor Sweet and then Councillor Lewis, I've just got one comment, really, from Quilo's table. It showed that Hillingdon have got a very high EV ownership. I think we've got probably one of the best in London, I think. Um, but with very few EV points. And he made that point himself and he said that's in the public domain all that information is this what you are looking to start addressing from this tender that is currently out because this is what we're getting as, as, as members the complaints are well we've brought this electric car where the hell do we charge it and as you quite rightly said our car parks do have charging points already but they probably are now past their sell-by date and do need upgrading. Um, hence why people like um, Councillor Barnes' son goes to the local supermarket because they've got all the new charging points in so you can go there and you can, you can charge cars there. Um, hopefully this is something that we're going to work towards addressing and hopefully this committee, when our final report comes to you, you will take on board the, the recommendations that will be within it to help shape Hillingdon's move forward. Um, it sounds like the tender is, is going that way. Um, but as, as, as a relevant cabinet member, has that been part of your driver, knowing that we've got the most electric vehicles within any London borough? It, and, it, and But the least EV points? A, a, a lot of that is and has already been taken account of. But... Some of those figures, uh, well, a, a number of those cars within or vehicles within those figures are not just um, residential domestic cars. There's a, there's a great many uh, that are registered through, for example, Heathrow um, and fleet vehicles. Um, right, so that account, that are so these, uh, account yeah. to fleet vehicles as yeah. well, not that, just that, residential. That are attributable to. I, I asked sort of Alan if he could. Um, break that down right. into what, I'm, what I would call residential domestic vehicles as opposed to fleet vehicles belonging to large organisations. Right. And I believe uh, I'm right in saying that a not inconsiderable number of those vehicles within those figures will not be residential domestic. They'll be um, commercial fleet. But the, uh, but that doesn't matter in a sense. No, no, no. What I'm much more interested in is meeting the demand as we understand it to be. And certainly the current um, thinking is that the, th that demand is best met initially with significant numbers of uh, charging units in car parks. Right. The, the point that Councillor Barnes makes is a good one because... As we, see, as we see the overall offer, it's a mixture of offers. I mean, I'm in talks with TfL, for example, because how obvious would it be if you commute uh, by car? I mean, not everybody walks to the nearest station. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you choose to commute by car and you can, par and you can plug your car in all day at the station, um, or, or, and then, of course, you've got the capacity to, to charge at the weekend at the station. And as we know, many of our uh, uh, TfL stations and railway stations are very close to large numbers of residential properties. There's that. There are the, um, uh, uh, the supermarkets and the out-of-town large shops. They're coming on board. Some of the petrol companies are putting charging units in there. So we see this as a, as a generalised offer. Yeah. Because I have to say, when I first took this on, like a lot of people, perhaps, my, my initial reaction was, well, hang on, we didn't supply petrol stations as no, a local authority, did true. we? No, we didn't. Very true. However, people's behaviour with regard to petrol and people's perceived behaviour with regard to charging is very different. 100%. And, and I think Brian was right about how 
the education of how people use their electric vehicles. In other words, charge it up at some stage and you will have a, a range of, of you. Well, it's the same with, people don't go to petrol stations and just put 10 quid's worth in like we used to do in my day when five quid will put, would fill up the whole tank. Um, they fill up, don't they? They tend to. Yeah. So uh, I think there's a range of offers that are going to be out there um, and they will come on fairly quickly. Our, our hope and anticipation is that electric is the way to go. What we don't know, of course, is that in 10, 15, 20 years' time, somebody somewhere hasn't come up with something else. But I think the difficulty is that rather like uh, vinyl, video, CD, DVD, and then streaming, we're in a process. Exactly. Um, very, very quick, can, can we request as a committee, if, if Alan Tilly is able to break down those figures... Could those figures be shared with us? Because obviously, when you see these figures, and that's what residents will look at, they won't think, well, that includes fleet vehicles. Mm -hmm. Look, Hillingdon, we're, we're being told we're the greenest because we've got the most electric vehicles. But when you're saying there's fleet within there, etc., mm -hmm. that's not what the residents see, because that, that chart is the one that's available in the public domain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, all the, all the um, electric vehicle charging uh, department within the Department of Transport do is tell you how many uh, vehicles, vehicles are, within are registered in, in your borough. Yeah. It doesn't tell you, well, it may, and I will find that out for you, yeah. but I, I, that's the figure we work from, yes. but ancillary to that, I'm told, ah, well, don't forget that quite a lot of these are not just domestic residential vehicles. And we've also got to remember a lot of our fleet is electric. Um. <laughs> well, it, oh, I was astonished at the differential in pricing to the extent that I got it written down for me, or I wrote it down. Um, uh, a, a, um, the price of a, um, of a refuse collection vehicle, electric refuse collection vehicle, is 480,000 as opposed to diesel powered which is 162. Yeah. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Right. But again, right. over time, <coughs> like all, as, or like all right, developed new things, it'll come down. No. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Sweetin. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I said before, the minutes of the last meeting are very detailed, and they did come up with various suggestions and I was wondering whether the council is already taking up some of the committee's recommendations. I mean, they're particularly listed on pages two and three. Um, we need to take our residents with us, don't we? We need to share information of what we're doing and how we're doing it and, and getting their views on things. And the minutes were very, very clear on certain things that Mr. Heritage highlighted. So it would be good to know uh, um, issues such as providing information to residents on the council's website. Yeah, can, can, obviously, this is going to make yeah. our this well, is going to make our report. It's unfair for Councillor Riley to answer this at the moment because this will be the recommendations of our final report once this committee has agreed what goes in as the recommendations after all the witness sessions. Um, and I've already had discussions with Steve and the committee were quite um, adamant that some of what Mr Heritage said does get included within this committee's final report. So it, we won't ask Councillor O'Reilly for his intention on what's going ahead at the moment. Um, well, can I just say this, that I, I, uh, well, when, I when, when, when um, Councillor Burroughs first asked me about this, or we talked about it, because I thought it was a good idea for this committee to look into this, it did seem to me that the, the best value of this would be your in investigation into the subject and making recommendations while I as cabinet member was sort of driving the policy in terms of what we wanted to do and where we wanted to get to and you would you, you would contribute mostly to the sort of blue skies thinking and recommendations in terms of going forward and that's exactly what you're doing and I'm very grateful. Oh, can I actually sort of complete what I was saying because I think it's important that we do get the views of our residents because this is data collection. So we're not, we're not suggesting... Um, we're not su we, we all agree that, and that's why we had Mr Heritage in, to, to get his views and, and bring forward what he brought forward 
with his frustrations and that's what came out in, in that last meeting and that's what's driving some of the recommendations that we were discussing at the last meeting could possibly be in our final report. But it seems that we're leaving out our residents. But we're not leaving out our residents because Mr Heritage is one that's driven some of what we're taking forward into our final report. But getting information from our res residents as resident. we're going through. That is really what I'm saying. To inform our final report, it would be good to know, uh, have things on the Council's website to say this is what we are proposing. Your views on certain things would be appreciated. Please, Steve. Um, following the last meeting where, where there was, the committee agreed um, to collect data, to have some kind of form, essentially what Mr Heritage uh, suggested, for the meantime, whilst our review is still ongoing, um, the committee agreed that there'd be some kind of holding information available for residents on the website, informing them there's a review going on, there will be charging point, there's a tender out, um, not necessarily all the details, but just informing residents that it's, it's in capable hands and it's, it's progressing. Um, I have spoken to Alan Tilly about potentially getting that information up because there's no point waiting until the review is done to have that information available. Um, so I believe he's taking that up the... Uh, uh, authority chain to, to put something on the website available for residents whilst our review is still ongoing. That was exactly the point I was trying to make. Sorry it didn't come across that way but okay points taken and it's been clarified for democratic services. Councillor Lewis. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rowley. I listened with great uh, interest and, I, and I, I, I congratulate you on the idea of using a commercial partner because actually councils are not particularly great at uh, implementing commercial charging points and as you said we've never supplied petrol so why should we be supplying electricity um, <coughs> the, I, I do think there's a socio-economic aspect to this that people who buy cars electric vehicles surely think about the charging of them before they buy the cars and, and I suspect they are very expensive generally uh, and that most of the purchases of them are have their own charging points. Uh, it would be interesting to know what, uh, what the ratio is of those buying cars and charging them publicly and charging them privately. Um, uh, which I can, I can see why we would get involved in the policy and the planning policies, but I, I, I really can't see why we actually are trying to sell electricity, which is basically what it's all about. Um, and, and my only other comment really would be about Heathrow and, and them having uh, electric vehicles. They've got a long way to go before they become a green organisation uh, running an airport that is polluting our borough terribly. So um, that, that was really what I wanted to say. So um, I, I'm not sure there's much for you to comment on there, but uh, I'm, and I, again, a bit of a rant, but I'm, I'm just not convinced about electric vehicles and the absolute necessity for them and, and that they are actually going, they are going to change our lives as dramatically as everybody thinks they are. But I do commend you on the, the electric charging points in the in the car parks, which I think that's an absolutely fantastic idea. But again, we should be encouraging the petrol stations and the um, and the supermarkets, and maybe maybe the planning uh, we could be looking at the planning consents for them, putting them into into the car parks and uh, uh, and helping them to uh, establish that. But the, the, there's certainly um, a, a, a determination to be made, and again, this will be informed by our commercial partner, whoever that will be, about the chicken and egg situation in terms of purchase and availability of charging. At the moment, I think we're, and it's just my own thought process, we're, we're, we're going down the route of encouraging, on the basis that this is one of the um, ways of moving away from what is deemed to be uh, fossil fuel being a bad thing then um, this is the direction of travel that, that's been determined 
Whether that's proved to be right or wrong much further down the line, I don't know. The point is that if, if, that, that if as a country, uh, we're being encouraged to go down this route, then the, um, the answer to the chicken and egg situation is to provide the wherewithal for charging. Now, we can't have any, if we have no influence over the cost of electric vehicles, I commend Councillor Morgan for his bravery in uh, having two, um, and I hope it all goes well. Uh, many other people will have got um, electric vehicles and all the rest of it, but the point is, I think in order to be able to encourage others, we're going to have to have a degree of on-street charging. I thought it was interesting listening to our earlier witnesses because that, that two-metre pole, my, my email bag is already very full of complaints from residents about street furniture, the number of things that we are caused to put on, let alone what we want to put on streets, drives people possessed. And um, to have another range of things as street furniture is going to also upset people. But nevertheless, um, this is the direction of travel. And it's the way we manage it that's important. And it's, it's, it's the engagement and how we as an authority manage it, which is why I don't want to get involved in the financial and commercial side of it. If we've got companies, and we do, who are already experienced in putting in units in a, a measured and cautious way, and then the take-up goes with that, then let's get, let's get in with them, whoever comes along with their best tender and all the rest of it, and, um, and, and be guided by them. Because the other thing they do, as I say, is to provide information about the stage that you're at and where you want to be, and you can go a bit faster or a bit slower, and they can deal with all of that. And we're not using residents' money to do that because they have access to a load of money in terms of grants from different organisations, from the government, from the mayor's office, from all sorts of other interested groups. So we're, we're, we're keeping our costs down, but keeping our interest up. And our risk down. It's quite a good slogan. And obviously what we have to remember is whether we agree with the electric vehicle programme or not. Um, unfortunately, we've been driven down that route as, as you listed your Betamax and VHS, etc., etc., etc. That's the route that took. We've been driven down this route. We all know that there was the, the, the COP26 um, meeting um, not so long ago where they agreed many different things to, to save the planet. And some of these we may agree with, we may not agree with. Um, and we may have our own views on it. Um, and everybody's, we're all entitled to our own views, but unfortunately local authorities are being driven down this route, excuse the pun, because it's electric vehicles, um, quietly driven. Um, I've always said they're, they're too quiet because you can't hear them coming. I, I said that when the first one came out and I actually had um, people from the blind community and the, um, come to me and say that, you know, they can't hear them. Um, and so that, that's something that obviously be dealt with. Just, at just some two point. very quick points. Um, there are companies in America I've been made aware of who have engine noise vehicles that make engine noise? They're just not. They're just, you know. Yeah, just uh, words so you can actually but hear. But at least you, you can, can hear, hear what's coming. Yeah. And secondly, I was in a meeting a couple of days ago with TFL, uh, with the head of bus, uh, uh, um, as uh, her title describes her, and she was talking about a little bit more down the track in terms of the future, but electric, electrified. Um, transport vehicles, which will apparently need an extraordinary amount of charging. And unless the future has um, buses that can charge up in the morning and travel all over London, every borough is going to need to be able to provide the capacity to charge Charging. buses in its own borough, and that is going to be a very significant undertaking. We, we do have hydrogen buses, of course. We do have hydrogen buses, of course, which are clean and green. Okay. Um, Councillor Hinton, you, you indicated. I did, thank you. Um, what shall I start on? Um, yes. 
Well, actually, uh, there are some systems for buses where they can be charged while they're stationary, so that they can, while they're at a stop, they can actually be, yeah, charging. Um, and, yeah, wireless, or alternatively, there are systems where trams operate without any overhead wires, and they have a battery which they charge up at some of the tram stops. So they then move between the tram stops on the electric battery. So th that's one thing. I'm, I think it would be very interesting to try and get an estimate of the number of electric vehicles, electric cars, effectively, um, where there is off-street charging. And I guess that the majority of people who are buying um, electric vehicles will have off-street uh, charging. Um, the real difficulty is that although Councillor Lewis says, well, people are going to have a look and see whether they can find the system for charging before they buy an electric vehicle, in 10 years' time, they aren't going to have much choice. They're either going to have a new electric vehicle or an old diesel or other combust um, combustion vehicle. Um, so I think we really do need to see some way in which we can get on-street charging. Um, I appreciate that it's really difficult. I think it's going to be almost impossible for that to be done by a commercial company entirely um, because the likely use of those is going to be very limited overnight. You can only have one car, one electric vehicle being charged at a particular point, maybe two if you kind of a double one, mm. overnight, because they're going to be charging all night. Yeah, well, they will be attached. I don't think somebody will want to go out at two o'clock in the morning when they've found that their ch car is now charged up and unplug it and let somebody else drive in to use it. So it's going to be overnight. So there's a limited, uh, num limited amount of use that some of those... Anyway, I mean, that, that's my thought. So I would, I would see that there would be quite a significant number of charging points required, particularly in areas, I don't know, parts of Norfolk Hills, for example, where you've got relatively... Tolkien Drive around there. There's no off street parking at all. Um, it's very congested. <laughs> um, and yet, that's the sort of area where there's going to be a great demand for electric vehicles in 10 years' time. That, that's why I was very surprised from our guests saying that they, d they weren't aware of any communal conflict because. We must not forget that in this borough um, there have been and continue to be uh, resident requests for parking management schemes. And I can very easily see a conflict between parking management schemes, parking anyway, and parking for charging. And at the minute, I haven't resolved that one in my own mind, let alone trying to resolve it more widely. Because I, I and, and in some areas, our roads are so narrow that we have on pavement, as you know, parking, on and off pavement parking, as it were. And in some of our areas, we've had to put in um, yellow lines on one side of the road because the road is so narrow that if you parked on both, you couldn't get a car, let alone an ambulance or a fire engine, down between the two sets of parked cars. We are one of the highest car ownership boroughs in London, and, um, and it's a borough that was largely, I suspect, built in the sort of 20s and 30s and 30s and 40s in terms of the size of driveways and so forth. I mean, I remember when we first went to uh, our house in Ryslip, the garage was too small widthways to get a, a car in. Uh, uh, and I suspect it was built for a forest miner or something. I mean, you know, wish that we had one now or something. It would be worth a lot of money. But um, but the point being that, that that our infrastructure was never designed for the sort of vehicles we have now. Uh, I think what we've got to remember is that the reason they haven't got conflict when they install these is look at the cities they've installed them in. It's in Germany in Munich, 
etc. Hamburg. Um, so they've got over those conflicts somehow, but they're certainly not going to tell us how. Um, and there, I would imagine there was conflict somewhere in some areas. Um, but you, you heard him say how much red tape they have. Certainly sounds as if they have more red tape than we have here when they're trying to put something in. Um, so there you go. I don't I've think it's red tape that's the problem. <laughs> no, I don't. No. Um, well, I've got Councillor Morgan down and Councillor Lewis. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I don't know if Councillor Riley has been looking at this idea, but you know it's great that we're looking at using the, the car parks um, for the, the poles or whatever uh, other means. But um, I'm not sure if you've been looking at uh, the uh, charging that they're using in Oslo, uh, where it's actually in the road. It's a little panel in the road. It's wireless charging that um, they're using it at the moment for taxis, um, and they're, they're testing it all out, where literally as a, the taxi is sitting in a taxi rank, it's been charged, and then it, it moves off and, and does whatever it has to do. Um, obviously, as a, a, a piece like that, if it's sitting in the ground, um, you could put those in parking bays, um, and that means you don't need to have something on the pavement uh, cluttering up the, the street scene. Um, it's just thoughts that you know maybe we should start thinking out of the box, do we need to have something where we've got to have a, a cable running across the part of the pavement? You know, if it's wireless, you know, perhaps we should be looking at that. Again, I know that, again, talking to our colleagues in Oxfordshire when they went through this process, and I know that our officers talked to their officers when we designed our, our um, tender offer. Um, Essentially, the, 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 the company or organisation that we uh, partner with are instructed to look at everything, uh, uh, look across at other countries, look, uh, look at other uh, authorities, just, you know, just to do exactly that. Each, each new uh, partnership is slightly ahead of the, the previous ones because that's the way it's working. Um, they told me in Oxford that they'd heard about some um, uh, work in America again, where th they have come at this from a completely different way, and the, 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 the car is a shell, and the idea is to have a, a, I don't say portable, but more portable than not battery. So you take it out, you, you take the battery out of the shell of the car and charge it up in your premises. It's essentially, it's a, like a mobile. I mean, a very big mobile phone battery, but nevertheless, I mean, but it's only been again very early stages. But who knows? I mean, maybe 10, 15 years down the line, will uh, uh, people will be able to have a, 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 a battery pack of some description that gets wheeled out and uh, and charged on on the, uh, somewhere in their premises, and then in the morning you slot it back in and off you go. I mean, I just I just don't know. But I think that. The capacity for uh, development is extraordinary in this area. I really do. But we have to meet the challenge as we are now. And it's like every other, as I say, um, piece of new technology. You know, when we first had mobile phones, you had to get two strong men to come and walk behind you with the battery. Now it's, uh, well, I did anyway. Uh, uh, now, now they're tiny little things. And how long is that? 20 years? Very true. Um, I've got Councillor Lewis and Councillor Barnes. Uh, can I can I just say about inductive charging, which is what you were talking about with the wireless? Uh, you just cannot get the amount of power from the ground into the into the car. So it, that's it. No, that's what that's what they're actually testing it now. I, I, they I'm might not. be, but it won't. It will, it will never. I'm actually a, a trained as an electrochemist. So uh, batteries are uh, have been a large part of my life. It will never work. The problem with lithium batteries is their their uh, lithium is a, is actually a, a very light metal. Um, the atomic number is three, and it was all created in Big Bang, and is everywhere. But it's um, it doesn't hold very much of a charge. So you actually end up with 
ridiculously heavy cars like Tesla's over two tons, uh, and you're actually the energy is is required to move the car around, not the passengers around, and that's the big issue. The coming back onto Councillor Edgington's comment about people needing to charge their cars overnight. The, as we have extended ranges on the cars, and we're getting to three to 500 miles now, ranges, you don't have to, the average, the average journey is something like 12 miles. So or per day, the average commute is, is something quite low. You don't have to charge your car up every day. You will, it'll be similar to going to a petrol station once a week, once every two weeks, to charging your car up. So the, the usage of the, the charging points will be will be shared by 10 cars, which is what Brian was saying, is absolutely right. So you, you don't have to charge it up every night. So we shouldn't be fighting over the, the charging points. Thank you. Councillor Barnes? Can I just say, what, some of the other ideas about inductive charging are that actually you could have it along the, the, uh, the, the, the roads. So you actually charge up as you're driving along. And when your batteries are full, then you then you because you're generating power and when you're braking, you could actually be uh, giving power back into the grid and actually uh, uh, earning credits for it as well. There are lots of things that are going to happen in the, uh, over the years, but it, it's not new technology. Unfortunately, Lion, Lion batteries have been with us for about 30 years, and it's not new technology, and it's still the most inefficient way of actually charging and keeping charge in, in vehicles. Uh, battery packs, are, the idea is in petrol stations that they will uh, swap them out and you'll just rent your battery pack and you buy it with a certain charge. Uh, things will happen. Yeah. Who, who, who knew that Scalectric was right? <laughs> yes, but it would certainly be interesting, wouldn't it, if you have all this in your road system and then long come the gas board, long come yeah. sky, long come... Affinity water, etc. Dig up, dig up, dig up, dig up. Patchwork. Oops, we've just broken that connection. Like on the scale, extra. You've track, broken my I pavement heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, um, Councillor Barnes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, basically, listening to what Councillor Lewis was saying, that well, him saying that this is not, this is, this is not new technology, but this is obviously an extremely. Um, right now moment that we need to go through and do something. It's, when we started this a few months back, when we started this whole situation, this debate to talk about this, I thought we were at a really um, good point, but actually each month we have these meetings and each month I'm starting to realise actually we're just at, this is the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's just massive. It's really, really massive. Uh, I just wanted to sort of I was thinking about my sort of line of work. I can't believe how many electric vehicles I sit in every day now. There's so many driving instructors that own electric vehicles, complete electric vehicles. I'm, I'm astonished at. And I think people like, like government aid, like the DVSA, should also be taking a huge part in, like, you know, just the examiners going to work, for instance. There's no electric park, uh, spaces in my car park when I go to work, where the, but they should be. Um, and, and that's like, I mean, I must be the only driver who's got a diesel car now. Everybody else seems to have an electric one. And they're insanely quiet. I still have got no idea when the engine's on. You just can't hear a thing. But, but that aside, um, my, uh, like when Cameron bought his car, he, was, he didn't want to get one, an electric vehicle. He felt forced to do it because of the issues we had with the petrol. So he decided, he researched, and he found a second-hand BMW and bought it for £18,500, which at the moment, there's barely a second-hand market out there for electric vehicles, but he found one. Um, and he absolutely, he's quite happy walking about half a mile down to the supermarket and charging his car, like you said, for just a couple of hours. It's only once a week, and he travels every single day in his vehicle all around London because he's a tennis coach. So he uses it every single day. Um, but he only needs to charge it about once a week, which is brilliant. Whenever he goes to the supermarket, no matter what time of day or night it is, all the charging points are empty. There's hardly, if, if there's anybody, there's like one other vehicle there. Nobody seems to be using them. They're always empty, always. Um, there's another car park at the supermarket further up the road, and he says, I never bother going there because they've got these fast chargers and they're always broken. 
So we always go to the ones which are a sort of standard charge. And he finds that he also researched with the government grant you get, 300 pounds I think it is, to get your own charger at home. He looked at all of that and he just said, if I get one at home now, even though we've got a driveway, he said it's going to cost me another thousand pounds to have it fitted. And then um, it w it's still going to cost to charge it because it comes off the electricity at home. And he's, he's basically said, I'm happy just to go down the road and have it charged at some, you know, somewhere else completely for free. It is not cost, it's not cost effective to just do it from home. Well, again, the, 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 the monetary charging uh, methods is, again, something that um, different companies uh, uh, who uh, become involved with local authorities to help them uh, are very much wa uh, aware of. Um, it was interesting that I went to Oxford and then later I went to um, Eastleigh and Wandsworth and uh, um, going to the other two after Oxford, what we were told there was even then within, I don't know, what was it, a few weeks, was a little bit different in terms of what was going on. Um, I don't say that there was any great advance in two or three weeks, but something else had happened or there had been a bit more knowledge about uh, about the uh, the charging the monetary charging structure and there and the the irony is that uh, uh, as Councillor Lewis was saying the, the sort of social um, access aspect everyone's assuming that somehow the the the, the disbenefit will be on those without on site on domestic site uh, charging actually the the um, the offer to on street but off site charging appears to be more financially beneficial than it is to the folks with a driveway and access to putting a, a, a unit in. But again, that, um, that 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 cost, I'm assuming I have no basis for saying this, but just on the simple fact of a reduction in cost of technology as we go along. Uh, is likely, I suspect, to come down. Um, but I do have this residual concern at the back of my mind, generally, about the whole business about capacity. Um, and I, and I, I think there is a great deal of excited optimism about capacity and not a lot of realism. And I do worry about that. Um, it was bad enough when we had the petrol crisis a little while ago, but if you had that every day, I suspect there would be an awful lot of very worried people. Um, but, yeah, uh, I, uh, in, the reality is that we are in a position and we have to do something. We've been careful, we've had a mind to cost to ourselves, and, um, and we've, we've been cautiously realistic. I'll, I'll, I'll just add as well that there are other electric vehicles available and second-hand market as well. Um, <laughs> Councillor Sweden, you have a question for Councillor Riley. Well, it's just to thank you for your very full report. I mean, my question, I want to be directed to the chairman, but thank you. I mean, it's such a massive issue. The more that we look at it, this is our final witness session, and... I know that we've got constraints, time constraints on this, but I would have welcomed a further witness session just to see what possibly the other London boroughs are doing about this or not doing about it, and maybe more um, residents putting their views because we've only had one, um, you know, one uh, resident, um, and others would have um, some more detailed knowledge possibly on that. So um, thank you for that, but my. My question really is to the chairman, is there no way of stretching this out? Because, I mean, the scoping report, page 16, does say residents, plural, and it does say something about London borough, boroughs being consulted as well. The issue we've got, obviously, is the time constraints on when it's got to go to Cabinet before a certain event in May <laughs> next year. Um, because all of the select committees have got to have their reports um, finalised and presented to Cabinet prior to obviously Cabinet being dissolved, if you like, for, for that event in May next year. So unfortunately we can't stretch it any further.
because of those constraints. Um, but I, I, I hope that what we can do is start to move the cabinet into thinking, um, and I'm sure that within within our report to cabinet, one of our recommendations could be, and certainly the website that they we're looking at as well is that we need to engage fully with our residents to get more views now where Councillor Riley is coming from at the moment is a good starting base from what you've already described to us as a committee that is a good starting base um, but obviously as Councillor Riley has, has said already technology within this field almost moves every single week and we've got to be cautious on where we start to go, especially with the public money, because not every resident in Hillingdon has an electric vehicle. Probably not every resident in Hillingdon actually wants to own an electric vehicle. They probably think, well, actually, I will just still run my petrol or diesel car after they've stopped selling them. I'll probably get a, a newer one. Um, but they may not be able to afford the electric vehicles because let's face it, the electric vehicle market at the moment, the prices are so high. We've we've heard how much <laughs> a second hand one costs. Not everybody's got that within their budgets at the moment. And so I think certainly within and I will give you this assurance that within our report to Cabinet there will be an element that we need our residents' input as we progress further forward most definitely well, thank you very much for that because certainly that will be an issue for many residents concerning the parking and the, the various uses of, of the space outside people's houses you, 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 oh, it's sorry. entirely a matter for you of course but yeah. but but because um because this is this is very much an ongoing project for me as the cabinet member you, uh, if you chose to come back to this in however many months time to see how things were going or just to keep the hoop turning as it were that would that, that's entirely a matter for you yes, this this could be ev part one councillor lewis i was just going to say i i i think we're we're neglecting the fact that both councillor barnes and councillor morgan are both residents of the borough and they both have electric vehicles uh, within their households. So I think we have heard from, I, in actual fact, it's a, it's a disproportionate amount of people on the committee mm. to actually have the electric vehicles. So I think we have heard from two more residents uh, and who have had, had given quite a lot of testimony. Uh, so I, I do think that's quite useful. Thank you. Okay, so any other questions for Councillor Riley? No? Councillor Riley, thank you for attending our committee. Um, this could be something actually after the event in May next year when the committees are back that could possibly come back on as another add-on review to monitor progress or it could be taken not as a major topic as it has been here but as a scoping item for the departmental reviews and updates as we go along so that we can feed into it that way but certainly I'd like to thank you on behalf of the committee for attending this evening and giving us an insight on where we're going obviously we can't say too much about the tender because it's still a live event at the moment um, but thank you and we do look forward to presenting our final um, report to cabinet um, in April next year. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. And just to say that um, looking at the terms of reference of this committee, which aligns exactly with my portfolio, if there are any other issues in the future that you want me to come and talk to you about, then I'm very happy to do so. Thank you. We will certainly bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item six, it's the Public Safety and Transport Select Committee forward plan. We've all had a chance to look at the items that are on here. Does anybody wish to comment on any of the items? Steve? 
Uh, just to note, yesterday a new forward plan was published. Uh, two new items came in under Councillor Riley's portfolio. First one is in January's meeting of Cabinet is the contract for the Council's Parking Enforcement Service. Um, following a procurement exercise, Cabinet will consider the contract for the provision of the Council's Parking Enforcement Service, which includes on and off street enforcement and the management of elements of the borough's parking infrastructure. And then added to September 22's uh, Cabinet meeting is the TFL Local Implementation Plan, the annual spending submission. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, the, the LIP submission um, may be reviewed by a different committee by then. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking September 22. <laughs> yeah. um, but certainly the, the other items, thank you. Any comments on what's on the forward plan or do we accept the recommendation that we note um, the forward plan items? Noted. Okay, then we move on to the last agenda item, item 7, which is our work programme. Um, obviously, tonight's meeting. We then have the 18th of January, um, where we will be um, welcoming back Councillor Morgan. Um, because <laughs> I, I have been, or, I have already been um, informed uh, ahead of ahead of time, um, and I I think because Councillor Morgan's already substituted on two previous meetings. I think it makes sense to bring him as a substitute to the next meeting as well because he's, he's heard a lot of what we're doing. Um, and at that meeting in January, as you will see, we have the findings. We then have the um, forward plan, but we also, I believe, have the um, budget proposals for the next financial year which should be extremely interesting to look at, I'm sure, um, and I'm sure there will be some comments. Um, so are we happy with this work programme as it stands with the 10th of February after that, the 8th of March, and then obviously 7th of April? Oh. That's sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, could we though have an update on the ASBET arrangements and how they're working? It was mentioned in the, um, the minutes of the antisocial behaviour report about a different way of working with ASBET. And also, um, if that could also include the report on the electric scooters, which we, which I don't which think was... Yeah, which I think you mentioned that before, didn't you? Yeah, it, was, you it was agreed that as part of the ASBET report, the issue of um, electric scooters, because my colleague, Councillor Marner, um, had raised that, I think, on the very first meeting that we had. Steve, can we get that update, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we get that update and we'll bring it to the next meeting. Um, well, that closes the meeting. I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Um, <laughs> probably the first chairman to be able to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you again to our substitutions, Tony, Becky and John. Um, because it does help oh, when we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, there's something you said. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been. <laughs>